Hi, everybody. So I'm going to share with you one of my passions. And it's not Pokemon Go. <laughs> that would be funny for a 45-year-old woman. But you, everyone recognize this image? How many people have played it? A few? You're on camera. OK. Um, I'm going to share with you a kind of strange fact that Pokemon Go and Albert Einstein have something in common. And it wasn't that Albert Einstein played Pokemon Go. Albert Einstein lived in a fascinating time for physics. He's probably the most famous physicist that's ever lived, maybe scientist. And he lived in a time when there was some tension building in how we understood some fundamental physics properties. We had developed a new theory of light called electromagnetism, and it was inconsistent with some of the previous notions of how motion worked, developed by Newton and Galileo. There were also some interesting discrepancies about how planetary motion, you know, the Earth and Mercury orbiting the sun, it was a little inconsistent, tiny, tiny inconsistencies with uh, Newtonian's theory of gravity. And when you have these things happen, a tension builds, and you know something has to change, because we need everything to match with experiment. And it's so famous, because when he developed the theory that would fix some of these inconsistencies, he changed the way we think about space and time. He actually had to abandon a sacred belief to us that time is absolute. And instead, he discovered that time is, in fact, relative. I don't mean the time that you feel being bored on a plane. There is some time change up there, but it's not from being bored. We mean the fact that when two objects are in motion relative to each other, time runs differently for those two objects. If they compare clocks, they will not agree. And we also mean that if there's a height difference, so compared to something on the surface of the Earth and something at a height from the surface of the Earth, clocks will again run differently. And this is such an amazing notion that's really captured the attention of a lot of people. And the, what happens when we look at something that's a mundane example, like the Pokemon Go, it runs on GPS. And the global positioning system is the best example I have to give you to understand how important it is to really solve equations like Einstein did, which he called the special and general theories of relativity. And if you look at how GPS works, those are satellites orbiting the Earth. And those satellites beam information down to your phone, pretend it's my phone, and your phone is what's your, usually your GPS. And so what's happening is, because the satellites are moving in it, relative to your phone, and because the satellites are at a different height from the surface of the Earth compared to your phone, time is running differently for you and the satellites. And if these things aren't corrected by using Einstein's theory, you'll be inaccurate very quickly. You won't find your Pokemon, you won't find Walmart, whatever you're looking for. So believe it or not, a theory that Einstein developed 100 years ago, you use every day, if you're like me and can't find anything, you use every day to, to locate stuff. And so Einstein didn't set out to do that. That's a consequence of something in fundamental physics. But other than this mundane example of GPS, Einstein's theories predicted two things that even Einstein himself wasn't comfortable with. He made it, the theory itself made two extraordinary claims. One of them was black holes, and the other was gravitational waves. And even throughout his life, he struggled with whether or not these were mathematical consequences of his theory, with no physical realization, or were they actually part of our universe? And that's where we're going next. Black holes have long fascinated me. I was a, apparently a very dorky child. And at 12, I was obsessed with black holes. Wrote a paper in seventh grade. <laughs> Made no sense. It's OK. Uh, I read Wrinkle in Time, you know, all that business. And I think they still capture the imagination of so many people. There's something very interesting about a black hole. So think about it. How does a black hole form? We have a star like our sun, but much bigger. Eventually, every star runs out of fuel. It will stop shining. It runs out of fuel, it starts to collapse, because nothing will beat gravity at that point. And if it's really big, you think of it collapsing like a balloon running out of air. But if a star is big enough, nothing will stop it from collapsing that we know of. And it actually goes all the way down, just pressure, pressure, until it sinks to a singular point. And at that point, we've created a black hole. The black hole will be much smaller than the original star. It's very compact. And it famously doesn't even allow light to escape, which is why you see these dark circles up here. So black holes have captured our imagination, because what they've done is in forming, as in collapsing to form this black hole, the curvature of space and time gets so tense, 
They're so stretched and it's such strong curvature, it's almost like we're creating a rift in space and time itself. Up here I have two black holes, because one is never enough. Always better to have two. This is a picture that's a computer generation. It's not an actual photograph of two black holes. And what we've done is this is a picture done by some of my colleagues, and they have um, rendered on a computer what would happen if there were two black holes between us and the center of the Milky Way. Has anyone actually gotten a chance to see what it looks like to look towards the Milky Way on a dark night? Can't do it in Atlanta. Uh, you can see beautiful images of it. It's a big stretch of starry milky light. And if you have two black holes between us and that milky light, the light gets so distorted as it goes near those black holes. The curvature of space and time is all funky and warped and twisted. The, the light looks warped and twisted because it had a travel curved path to reach our eyes. Now this isn't really a picture. This is just a rendition of what it would look like. But think about what's happening. If I have a star and a companion star, and both of them collapse to form a black hole, then they're orbiting around each other, just like the Earth orbits the sun. And eventually, they're going to merge together. They're attracted to each other. Think about what's happening to the space and time around it. It's just whipping and curving, and it's got to be the most intense thing out there. There has to be a physical consequence of such a dynamic and intense environment. And that leads us to our second extraordinary claim of Einstein. His theories claimed that when, when space and time are, are agitated like that, when a, something as compact as a black hole is accelerating, then we must give off some kind of energy. It's called gravitational waves. And near the source of this energy, it's going to be really intense, intense radiation. But we can't see it at all. It's not light. So I'm showing you a computer graphic. This is done by solving here at Georgia Tech. We solve Einstein's equations for two black holes colliding. And we predict what the radiation, what the gravitational waves would look like. So this is the movie. And you see that it's color-coded blue and orange to, to give you a sense of what the waves would look like, even though they're not viewable by the eye, because they're not electromagnetism. So the two black holes over each other, and they collide. They form a bigger black hole. And then this gravitational wave that comes pouring out of the event. And then we ask ourselves a question. Super dynamic, crazy curvature is happening near that system. But we're really, really far away. It's a good thing. Really far away from these black holes. They're far away into the universe. So what happens by the time they reach us on planet Earth? And can we figure out a way to measure them? To find out, was Einstein's theory predicting things that are right or not? So this is a scale that's vastly exaggerated. This is an image out of the LIGO collaboration. And what you're going to see is what happens when a gravitational wave hits uh, the Earth. So we're going to let the gravitational wave come from very far away, or we might not. This is why they tell you don't show movies at a TEDx talk, but I'm stubborn. So a gravitational wave comes, hits the Earth, and the Earth would actually wobble like a bowl of jelly. And what our job is as experimental physicists, I'm a theorist and I work with them, and I say this is what a gravitational wave should look like. And then they go and look for it. And the way they look for it is called the LIGO experiment. This is an experiment in Louisiana, and there's another one in Washington State. And so when a gravitational wave travels to the surface of the Earth, what it's doing is it's stretching space and time as it comes. And if I have two masses in an L-shaped arm, like we have here, one's hanging at one end of the station, another's hanging at the other, when the gravitational wave passes, it literally distorts space as it passes, and it causes these arms to change in length. And the LIGO experiment actually detects a way to, to, to detect this change in length and translate that into the fact that we've seen for the first time a gravitational wave. This is the ugliest image I've showed you. And this one is the most spectacular. So you have 100 years after Albert Einstein's theory has been developed. We have some 20 years of scientists, probably more than that, 30 years of scientists and engineers building an experiment. And what it has to do, this experiment has to basically see a wrinkle of space-time oscillation coming towards it that's so subtle that it's almost impossible to detect. And then it took 20 years for scientists like myself to solve Einstein's equations for two black holes so we could all come together and for the first time detect gravitational waves. So on September 14, 2015, uh, we have a binary black hole, so these two black holes were orbiting 1.4 billion years ago. And that information finally traveled to the Earth. So we were still single-celled organisms when this collision happened. And it took 1.4 billion years for the information to reach Earth. That's how far away it was. 
By the time it reaches us, it's super weak, barely detect it, and this is its picture, its signature. So it looks like a goofy sine wave, you know, with some mass because the detector is noisy. And it took about 0.2 seconds after traveling 1.4 billion years to pass through the Earth. But we were there. We were ready. Everything was in place. So it might not, doesn't look very impressive. This is the one from the Washington detector. But nonetheless, if you imagine the timing, it was pretty exciting to be one of the scientists working on this, having devoted my whole career to studying these black holes and Einstein's theory to actually be present when the first one was detected. And I think it says something about humanity that a human brain can think of a theory, come up with stuff that doesn't even make sense for 100 years, and we could actually build a detector and find out it really exists in the universe. Thank you. Thank you.